I'm particularly excited to introduce Fred Bowen today because I believe that Fred and I have been leading parallel lives. Like me, Fred is an attorney. Like me, Fred writes books for children. Like me, Fred loves sports. And like me, Fred is a sports writer, writing a weekly sports column for the Washington Post, Washington Post Kids Post for the past 15 years. But unlike me, Fred has actually retired from his day gig as a lawyer and now writes children's books full time, which explains why he's about to come up here and tell you about his latest book, and I'm about to get off the stage, sit down, and shut up. Fred has authored 20 children's books on sports, but really his books aren't just about sports. Sports is simply the setting Fred uses to teach life lessons to kids about growing up, about relationships, and even about a little history. In his most recent book, Double Reverse, the message of the book is, it doesn't matter whether you look the part, it matters whether you can play the part. Running off that theme, Fred tackles issues that mean something to young readers, like the self-doubt of a younger brother playing in the shadow of his older brother, like gender stereotyping, and like the assumptions people sometimes make because of the way someone looks. Booklist has said that Fred's books are flush with life lessons, and Washington Parent Magazine has said that his many action-packed novels speak to the hearts and minds of young sports lovers. More than anything, Fred writes because he loves to read and wants to encourage youngsters to share his passion for a good book. In his bio, Fred describes an experience, it describes an experience that I know very well, hiding under the covers at night when his parents thought he was asleep, using a flashlight to read books on sports. My favor favorite author of sports fiction when I was a kid was a guy named John Artunas. I read every one of his books multiple times, and I suspect that Fred may have read some of them too, and indeed, he has. Fred, after reading some of your books, there's no doubt in my mind that all around this country there are kids, boys and girls, hiding under their covers at night, probably using the light from their cell phones, reading your sports stories, and you can't wait till your next book comes out. Someday, at least one of them will also start writing sports books for kids. And when someone asks them who their favorite writer was as a kid, the guy who kept them under the covers at night, they're going to say it was Fred Bowen. So friends, please join me in welcoming Fred Bowen. Thank you. That was great. Thank you. All right, good morning to everybody. Uh, that's right, um, Fred Bowen, all those things he said about me were true. Uh, and uh, I do a bunch of things. One of the things that I do uh, is that I, uh, I write for the uh, Kids Post section of the Washington Post. Who, by the way, reads the Kids Post here? All right, good, the adults do. Uh, <laughs> I actually, it was funny, uh, just this Thursday, I don't know if anybody saw it, but the, um, I wrote on Tom Brady, who, uh, okay, that was not, as, uh, a woman in back in the crowd is giving me thumbs up and saying I did a wonderful job. That is not a unanimous opinion, <laughs> I have to say, that the, uh, I have gotten several, many uh, e angry emails about uh, Tom Brady. Uh, my article of Tom Brady, in which I just said that it, from the report, it looks like the Patriots probably uh, cheated and that uh, Tom Brady probably knew about it. Uh, I didn't think it was that controversial, but I also said that one of the things, and I tried to explain, is uh, the introduction was saying that I try to draw something out of sports, not just describe sports. And what I thought was important for kids to understand was that Athletes have, are called heroes, but that doesn't necessarily make them heroes. That athletes have a tremendous amount of physical courage. They, are, they can do incredible physical things. However, that does not necessarily make you into a hero. And I said that the um, heroes really, to me, have moral courage. In other words, the ability or the strength to stand up for what's right, to tell the truth in difficult circumstances, then I felt that Brady had failed. I'm actually going to Massachusetts next week. I believe I will probably find 
uh, on the post office walls my picture. Uh, Mr. Brady is incredibly popular up there, but uh, hopefully I'll uh, survive the week. What, what I'm going to talk about a little bit today are the books that I do. And the books that I do combine sports fiction, sports history. There's always a chapter of sports history at the back. This one is called The Golden Glove. And what it's about is about a kid who loses his favorite baseball glove, has to play with an old one that he doesn't think is as good, and uh, so what I tell the kids in the back of this book is about baseball gloves and how baseball gloves developed, which is when I go to schools, I always bring these. And these, I will ask the, the young people in the uh, audience, these are replicas. Who can tell me what a replica is? Anybody know? A replica, of course, is a model or a copy of something. And these are replicas or copies of the first baseball gloves. When people started playing baseball in this country, and now they think it's almost, they have the first indications about it, that it was about 200 years ago, you know what they wore on their hands? Nothing. And the reason they wore nothing on their hands is they were not very bright. But then, and it took something like, 60 years for them to figure out that, oh, you know, maybe we should have something on our hands to protect them. And so what they did was they took work gloves and they snipped off the tops of the fingers, which, of course, gave them the ability to throw the ball. Uh, the first guy, I believe, who wore them made the gloves flesh-colored. In other words, it made them the same uh, color as his skin because people made fun of him for wearing a glove. Which, if you think of it, is just, you know, they, they said to him, well, you know, what, aren't you man enough to play baseball barehanded? And he said, no, I'm just not stupid enough. But, uh, and of course, one of the lessons of that particular book, and I coached for, when my kids were growing up, I coached more than 30 teams. Uh, kids, youth teams in baseball, softball, basketball, and soccer. And I can tell you, the kids blame the equipment a lot. I used to have a kid who would swing the bat, something like this. He'd take it and just swing straight up. And he'd miss, of course. And he'd do it about three or four times, and he would ceremoniously go over to the bat rack and get another bat. And I'd say, well, that isn't really the problem here. But uh, so hopefully the kids uh, pick up the lesson uh, from the, that one. Another book uh, I like, this one's called The Final Cut. And uh, this one is about four friends who are trying out for a basketball team. And for the first time, they may get cut from the team. They may not make the team, which is becoming more and more of a common thing for kids as they're growing up. And if you think of it, I'll talk to the adults at this point in the crowd. If you think of it, we actually now have kids like eight years old trying out for teams. In other words, they may get cut from a team. There was a study done in Major League Baseball and over a period of, I think, for, I think it was something like 12 years, they studied the first draft choices, the first 30 guys taken in uh, the major league draft. And these are guys who are in college or seniors in high school. They are on the brink of becoming major league players. Only slightly more than 50% of those draft choices, the first ones, ever made it into the major leagues. And only about half of the ones that made it into the major leagues became regular daily ball players. And that means that men, and it's always men who are baseball scouts, men who have dedicated their life to trying to figure out who the best potential baseball players are in the entire country are wrong half of the time. But a part-time accountant from Bethesda 
will say, oh, I can pick out the best athletes in a group of uh, um, eight-year-olds. And that, I think, is crazy. And we have to stop doing that. In other words, I really do think that up until high school, just make more teams. We shouldn't cut anybody. We find out the athletes that way. And that's what this book is about, is the kids are trying out for a team. And in the back of the book, I tell them about a very famous basketball player who, of course, got cut the first time he tried out for a team. Anybody know? Michael Jordan. Who knows Michael Jordan? Not personally, you know, but uh, all the kids, although I was in a school the other day with really young kids, and a lot of kids didn't know who Michael Jordan was. Fame is fleeting. Very few people remain famous forever. Michael Jordan, the, the famous uh, story, of course, is that he got uh, moved from, or he tried out for the varsity as a sophomore, gets put on the junior varsity. I also tell the kids about Bill Russell. And Bill Russell, when you go to a school and you say, well, how many uh, you know, championships did Michael Jordan win? And the kids will sometimes know six, all right? He won uh, an NCAA championship. He won two Olympic gold medals. And then you say, well, who knows Michael Jordan? A lot of kids don't. When you start talking about Bill Russell, almost nobody knows him, you know, which is disappointing to me. And you say, well, he played 13 years in the uh, NBA. How many championships do you think he won? And kids will guess, like, well, two, three. And you write on the board, 11. And they go, 11? He won two NCAA championships. He won one Olympic gold medal just because he only played in one Olympics. And you point at the numbers and you say, Bill Russell is the greatest winner in the history of team sports. Now let me tell you a story about when Bill Russell was 15 years old. Bill Russell, when he was 15 years old, wasn't like Michael Jordan. He didn't try out for uh, the varsity. He tried out for the junior varsity. And the coach had 16 kids try out for that team. He had 15 uniforms to give out. And he didn't have the heart to cut just one kid. So he went to his worst player. And his worst player was Bill Russell. And he said, Bill, you can stay on the team, but you have to share a uniform with another player. And the kids are always like, what? And then you point at the numbers and you say, in about seven years, Bill Russell was the most valuable basketball player on the planet. And that, one of the great lessons of sports for kids is that things can change. Sometimes you feel, I think everybody feels this, is that somehow you're just sort of stuck in one place. And one of the things that sports really gives kids is the ability to see that they get better and they improve. Kids who swim, kids who run track, they see their times go down. They get better the more they work. And that is such, such a valuable lesson. Some of the books that are available for sale uh, in uh, the politics and prose uh, class I'll, or uh, tent I'll talk about now. And really, as he said, support politics and prose. Support local uh, uh, bookstores. They are wonderful institutions. This one, please don't tell the kids about this. And that is, this book is actually about writing. And what it's about is about a kid who is informed the first day, his name is Matt, that he has to keep a journal for school. And you can imagine that Matt is not happy with this assignment. And so uh, the teacher, though, tells him, well, what do you like? And he says, I like football. I'm going to be the quarterback on the junior high team. She says, well, write about that. And I tell the kids in the back of this book about the book Instant Replay. Does anybody remember that book, Instant Replay? Instant Replay was a diary kept by a member of the Green Bay Packers for the 1967 uh, football season. It was on 
the New York Times bestsellers list. Let me look this up. I have the statistic here. Whoops. There it is. It was on the New York Times bestseller list for 37 weeks in 1968. It was one of the most popular books of the year. And what it is, of course, the book talks about, uh, it was a fascinating uh, book by Jerry Kramer, but it was one of the first inside looks at what it's like to be a pro athlete. And uh, it was very popular, but now, of course, we get coverage all the time. But this was one of the first times. But one of the things I try to get the kids to think about is, Write about what you like. You know, in other words, I, th I go to schools all the time, and I talk to kids about the writing process, and sometimes I think the kids literally look from side to side and say, wait a second, is this legal for this guy to talk about this? Because I'm interested in it. In other words, lots of times, if you really think back on school, they're talking about things that, are, you know, not that interesting. And so it's great to come in and say, hey, we're going to talk about sports, and yeah, we'll slip in some writing and things like that, but it's going to be fun. This one is called Go for the Goal, and it's a uh, soccer book. And what I tell the kids in the back of this book is about the 1999 Women's United States World Cup team. And what that team had and they were the last, by the way, uh, uh, U.S. women's team to win the World Cup. They may win it this year, hopefully. Knock on the look of, well, I don't know, what is this, for Micah. But um, they, um, they had a coach whose only job was to, uh, to make the women into better teammates because they knew they had lost the uh, World Cup four years before by the slimmest of margins. And they knew that at the very highest levels of competition that the differences are very, very slight. And so uh, they hired this woman uh, to uh, uh, coach the team. Her name was a Hacker. I'm trying to think of her first name. I'm terrible with names. Colleen Hacker. She is still a coach out in the West Coast. And her job was to make the women into better teammates. And so what she would do is she would do team building exercises for every practice. For example, the women would have to, she would set up a rope, let's say, about this high. All the athletes could, if they wanted to, jump over the rope by themselves. But their assignment was, no, you have to link yourself together as a team and figure out a way to get over the rope without touching the rope. And so all the time, they were talking about uh, problem solving, who's going to play the roles on the team, what everybody's assignment is going to be. In other words, what a team becomes. The last book I'll talk about, and then I'll take some questions. This is the latest one, Double Reverse. And as he said, it's really about appearances. So often in sports, kids, other people, they look at somebody and say, oh, he really looks like a quarterback, or he looks like uh, uh, he should be able to play such and such a sport, or she can, you know, if you're tall, oh, you should play basketball. There are so many examples in sports, and one I, I used to tell, tell the kids, at the beginning of his career, Cal Ripken was considered too big to play shortstop. It appears that after, what, 16 consecutive years of never missing a game, that Cal Ripken could play shortstop. <laughs> he didn't, but he didn't look the part. Another guy I tell anybody remember, Tyrone Muggsy Bogues. Tyrone Muggsy Bogues played, I believe, 12 years in the National Basketball Association he was five foot three inches tall, three and a half inches tall. Is there anybody five foot three in here? All right, there you go. I mean, you weren't thinking about becoming an NBA player, right? I'm sure you thought about it, right? But uh, very, very, but he was an incredibly useful player. Um, and so many, and the other person I tell the kids about was Fran Tarkenton, who was 
almost no bigger than me. And he was an NFL quarterback for years when he retired. He had the records for most touchdowns, most yardage, most just about everything. And at first they thought, oh, well, he's going to get killed out there. He was injured once. He was injured once, actually went on to a very successful business career, uh, and so I guess he didn't get hit much. So now uh, i got a few minutes left. I'd love to take questions about anything, and I see a hand from an old friend. Jimmy, what do you have for me? So, Mr. When did you first, when did you first know in your life that you wanted to become a writer? Oh, when did I know that I wanted to become a writer? It's funny, I tell the kids, I was just in a school yesterday, and I tell the story, actually, I read from uh, the book, The Final Cut, which one of the characters talks about getting cut from a team, and that is actually my story. My ninth grade uh, uh, got cut from a baseball team, which was just heartbreaking. And I say to the kids, I didn't want to be a writer in the ninth grade, but the the thing that got me on to the writing thing, and you may remember this, uh, and that was my wife was working at a local newspaper, and uh, I was at a uh, cocktail party, which is always a good thing, and um, her editor came over and said, Fred, you love movies, you love to tell stories, you're funny, would you like to write movie reviews for me? And I started by writing movie reviews for a local Montgomery uh, County, I think it was called the Sentinel at the time, and then I, I also did one for the Journal, and that really got me addicted to publication, which is a lot of fun. I mean, after I wrote the Brady piece, several people, you know, emailed me, you know, friends and things, and people, oh yeah, I read that, I like that, or some people, mm, I got in an argument last night, uh, uh, not an argument, but a discussion with somebody. So. It was around that time, and then as my kids were growing up, I was reading them sports books, and I thought, gee, these aren't very good. <laughs> and, and I thought, hey, I can write a better one. So, uh, another question. Th thank Anybody you. Anybody way back there? Hi, They'll I run a uh, mic to you. I just wanted to thank you for the type of books you write, because I tutor in DC and uh, recently just started tutoring uh, a kid in the ninth grade, I think it is, and w we had a discussion to get acquainted. I said, how do you like reading? Because I was t tutoring him in reading, and he said, I hate reading. I hate books. And I was like, yeah. okay. Uh, when it, part of the, part of the t day is that he gets to choose a book that he wants to read, and then at the end of each hour, we spend time reading. And he just happened to chance across Winner Takes All, and... That was the part he looked forward to most of all during the tutoring session. We had these wonderful conversations at the, uh, at the end of the chapter where the boy makes the decision to... Yeah, actually the, the book, if I'll, I'll fill in right yes, here, okay. yeah, was that the book is about a kid who cheats at the beginning of the book to win a baseball game. And then it is what happens after that. And I often tell um, uh, adults that it's... Winners Take All is actually Crime and Punishment uh, by <laughs> Dostoevsky, but without any of the really difficult Russian names. Uh, and I think, and actually your, your story, which is wonderful, and I, if I could just address it really quickly, um, is one of the best things about what I do is I get emails, letters, uh, people standing up in places like this and saying that you helped kids who didn't like to read to read. In fact, I can remember the first time it happened. It was at Blessed Sacrament uh, School in Washington, D.C., and a teacher came up to me and said, I want to shake your hand because you got two kids who don't like to read to want to read. And I looked around. I went to Catholic school. I looked around at the crucifixes and stuff, and I looked at the woman and I said, then I go straight to heaven, right? <laughs> and you know, she had a wonderful answer. She said, if I have anything to say about it, you will. <laughs> so I am hoping when the day comes that I am standing in front of St. Peter or whomever, and when I am asked to sort of, you know, say, well, I wasn't perfect, but I'd like to 
is there anybody from Blessed Sacrament here? <laughs> Maybe somebody can uh, say that. Well, do you have a question aside from, I didn't mean no, to interrupt actually, your I testimony. I, I was just going to say that um, to, part of the greatness of it was, I asked him after the episode, what would you have done? And he said, yeah. oh, I would have done that. I said, why? Because cheating, you know. Yeah. And he said, because it's for the team. It was for the champ, it gets you to the championship. We had the most amazing conversation. And it's it carried on every week as we got to each part. It's actually, it's interesting. That book is 15 years old. Schools still use it as a one uh, book, one classroom, or one grade read and stuff. And it's really a, it's not, a, and it's funny. There's sometimes they'll bring in, like, the parents will read it. And the parents will come into these events, and I'm there. And they'll look at me and say, you know, this is a pretty good book. To which you always kind of think, well, duh. <laughs> well, you know, what do you, you think? I think people think of uh, children's writers as sort of, you know, there are clowns. And then a little higher than them, there are children's writers and stuff. Uh, it was, there was a children's writer who had a great uh, answer to the question. Somebody said, well, are you ever going to write an adult book? And she said, do they ever ask pediatricians whether they're, well, when are you going to work on adults? You know, I mean, it's... Children's writers, I find, are a fascinating group. I think I have time for one more question. Oh, okay. Um, what's the best book that ever turned into a movie? I'm sorry, my best book that what? That ever turned into a movie. Oh, well, I don't... Well, that I think the best book that ever was ever turned into a movie... I think that one of the, probably the best books is uh, To Kill a Mockingbird. Um, and it's a, uh, it's a really terrific uh, a adaptation of it. I recently reread To Kill a Mockingbird, and there is a wonderful chapter about the neighbor, I forget what her name is, who weans herself off of morphine uh, to, before she dies. And uh, it's not in the movie. And I had forgotten that chapter. And at the end, Atticus says, you know, there are a lot of different kinds of courage. And it's a wonderful piece, but it didn't fit into the movie. Uh, another book that I would say was uh, uh, very, really good was uh, The Maltese Falcon. And if you read the book and you see the movie, the rumor was that the director, John Huston, handed the book to his secretary on Friday and said, take this home and just type it up, but leave out all the descriptions. <laughs> and uh, that, that was, it was, because there is so much of the book in the movie, and it's, it's really wonderful. By the way, the, uh, I don't know if anybody has read Elmore Leonard's 10 Rules of Writing. Everybody should, it's a lot of fun. And his major rule is, and it's a great rule for uh, kids' writers, and that is leave out the stuff that people skip. <laughs> and I think what uh, actually what kids' writers try to do is we try to leave out the stuff that people skip. Listen, thank you very much. I'll be signing books over there. It's a lot of fun. This is a great event. Thank you.